Ciao, dottore. Ciao. <laughs> Amore! Amore! <laughs> three, amore! Three! We three. have three. Three, three amores! One, two, and three! <laughs> so nice, so nice to meet you guys in person. I, in, uh, I know Alessia and I had spoken before, and Jessica, we had exchanged some messages, but now it's, it's real and, and we're here. Yes, Such a great I'm opportunity so to see you. Yes, <laughs> we are so excited because we want to share a little bit our story and then with a professional in the endometriosis. It is yeah. like because in my experience, when we came to the United States, it was pretty rare to find um specialists. Specialists in endometriosis, like it was and then hey, who is in America? A Italian. <laughs> <laughs> you probably said, let's run away. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna be he's gonna we're gonna have we're gonna have a lesson with the bandage over his eyes and say, This doctor. No good. <laughs> no, no, no. I listened to the accent. No good. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. Anyway, jokes apart, really an amazing opportunity. And uh, I thank you. Uh, I thank you for actually being so candid about your personal history. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people who, you know, are, are very visible or celebrities, you know, sometimes they talk about stuff, but they never tell the whole story. Right. Yeah. People always say a little bit, but never say the whole story. So I think that it was very courageous and brave of you guys that yeah. to really just to say everything. Yeah, because right. for her struggle, when we have her struggle, we was searching online so much, but we don't find a lot of information. So right. when we decide to share her story, we said, no, we need to share everything because we can help uh, people like us in a hard situation. How? Uh, because uh, endometriosis, it is really a disease, really uh, common. So it's really important to find the right information up there, you know? And that's actually one of the reasons I gravitated toward your page on Instagram when I was in the, you know, research phase, not finding much out there. You go into so much detail and you give so much information that I couldn't find anywhere else. Exactly. I saw your page and I was follow immediately <laughs> yes you're it's, the only one. it's interesting because well thank you first of all but i think it's interesting because believe it or not when i first started doing i've been on instagram now for about five years believe it or not you know although i have you know not that you know very few followers because it's a very specific area but you know people like doctors were like looking down on me they were like oh the instagram doctor you know and uh, now everybody's asking me, Hey, you know, like, how do we do this? You know, like, you know, you know, it's like the Mayo clinic, you know, how do we do this? You know, they all want to know how to communicate with people because in reality, and, uh, we get most of our knowledge, believe it or not from social media. Now it's crazy. Yeah. The power, I mean, the power that you guys have also, <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah, and I think that's very, very important. And, uh, but, you know, let's uh, let's start talking about your story. And, you know, of course, I follow you, so I know a little bit. But I'd like to start from the beginning. And, and you know, tell, first of all, I know you don't ask a lady how old she is, <laughs> how old they are. But how old are you, Jessica? I am 33, almost 34 in March. Yes, yes. And how how long did you know you had endometriosis? When When did you have? this diagnosis? When, when, oh. when did you think you had it? What, what happened? So what happened, I, I first found out when I was 28. Mm -hmm. So I had had actually thyroid issues for a very long time. I had um, toxic multinodular goiter thyroid, mm -hmm. and it got to the point where we needed to remove my thyroid. And mm -hmm. up until that time, that was pretty much the only issue that I felt or knew about in my body. But after I had that surgery, suddenly, because I'm sure hormones and everything were raging and trying to regulate, I started to have incredible pain during my cycle, heavy cycles, and it just got worse and worse over the course of about six months or so. And it seemed like it came out of nowhere for me because I had actually had not a lot of pain or abnormality in my cycle growing up. But after I turned 28, we went about six months, I was told it's normal, everything's fine, your body's adjusting after surgery, 
Um, and so I just kind of ignored it and endured it. Endured yes, it. I endured it exactly. Days when I would wake up in the middle of the night, it would the pain would wake me up from sleep, and eventually. I started to have gastrointestinal issues as well. And I started to have sort of this little bulge in my abdomen. And I just thought, oh, I, I must not be doing my ab exercises as mm -hmm. often as I, I used to. So Alessio said, no, we need to, we need to go see somebody. We need to figure out what this is. Your symptoms are just getting worse and worse. So we ended up going in and they thought I had diverticulitis actually based on my symptoms. So they sent me mm -hmm. into a CT scan. And on the CT scan, they saw two very large cysts. So one was, I think, 10 centimeters. Wow. The other one very was good. seven centimeters. So Huge. both very large. And because of the, the scan, they couldn't exactly figure out if they were connected, where they were, because it just kind of blocked out everything. So they saw just 17 centimeters. 17 centimeters. Oh, they thought it was like a... Yes. Well, yeah. let's backtrack for a second. Were you on hormones before this all happened? Were you on birth control pills or anything like that or no? Never had been, no. And never, And you never felt any signs or any sort of like below nothing just basically this thing started kind of out of the blue and then and then it just progressively ramped up that's what yes happened. yes and you and you put it in connection with your thyroid surgery which you know there's a possibility you know maybe it was a, a surgery an inflammatory process you know an operation an operation causes i'm just hypothesizing but you know an operation starts you know causes a lot of inflammation the body is fighting a battle on one side here because obviously a thyroidectomy is not a small surgery, right? It's a big operation. And uh, and then next thing you know, boom, everything explodes there. And, and this is one of the parts of it that I always tell people, we always have to think of the body, our bodies, not as made of pieces. You know, this concept of holistic medicine, looking at the person in their entirety and not just thinking the thyroid, the uterus, the... Everything is connected. And, you know, I think that's an example where how things are interconnected and maybe that's what was the trigger. And you got blown off for a few months, but compared to the average person, you know, who gets blown off for seven years, at least somebody kind of like know. noticed. I know. I was so, I, when I, because when they told me after that first surgery that they found out it was endometriosis, I had never heard of it before. So I went mm -hmm. on and started to do all this research. And that's when I saw that the average person takes years and years yeah. to get a diagnosis. So I was, I felt very fortunate that I had a relatively quick um, yeah. diagnosis. It, it, it's interesting because like, you know, instinctively I like to say, well, what is endometriosis? Because maybe I think almost everybody knows, but I guess not, people, not enough people know because, well, let me ask Alessio. Alessio, what is endometriosis? I don't know. Say like that. <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, no, yeah, right. no, no. Before, before, me, before this program, I don't know. But now I that what I know, but probably is not the correct thing. It is something like uh, I don't know if it's some of these cells that produce. They are a little bit crazy. Produce this blood, and then they start making and make like a cyst inside. It is liquid, and then they growing, and then they uh, it's inflammation, pretty much. A big inflammation that these cells could they uh, go crazy and then they start to reproduce. Sort of, sort of other <laughs> specifics. No, no, but I mean, I think you know, basically, you hit it just right, which is, it's an inflammatory condition, and that's exactly I think is the best definition. And the cells, these are cells they look like the endometrium, but it's not the endometrium. It's an important concept. And uh, once they grow, they can make cysts, but it's really an inflammatory condition. And your body's fighting a battle. And what I tell people is that, you know, sometimes you get a little, you know, a little canker sore in your mouth or a little, and it hurts so much. And it's like the size of like, so tiny, but you're going crazy because you have like something in your mouth, right? Yes. Imagine having something this big inside your body and what you just, you just don't see it, right? Because right. it's inside, but it's horrible. Your body's fighting a huge battle and that takes away a lot of, physical energy because it's it's really like a tremendous battle that your body is fighting 
And uh, another thing that I'd like to add, given the fact that you had the thyroid disease, and the thyroid is autoimmune, it's an autoimmune condition. So what happened is that your immune system probably went down. Mm. Oh. And it allowed it allowed the, the everything to grow. That is very probably between the thyroid and the surgery, you had like a lot of immunological problems, and, and that's sort of what happened. So, you know, that's another sort of theory where maybe you had a little bit growing there, but when your immune system went upside down, that's sort of what happened. And I think that, you know, probably is the thing, you know, that went down. You they found these two cysts, and then what happened? Yes. So, well, <laughs> it was, it's all a blur. Actually, it was very um, quick. So I actually got after the, the CT scan on the way home, the hospital called me and said, turn around. We want you to come back immediately. We want you wow. to see a gynecologist because we're concerned about the size of these cysts. Mm -hmm. So I basically got, I went, I got home. I scooped Alessio up. We went yeah. to the hospital and the gynecologist there mm -hmm. was basically expressed his concern that I had ovarian cancer. They right. were very worried that that was yeah, what they, this might be. Yeah. So they called in um, a gynecologic oncologist to do my surgery. Mm -hmm. And he came up. We had my surgery about a week later. And it actually ended up being a laparotomy. So a full wow. open surgery. Up and down incision or? or it or was vertical, down? up and down. Wow. All yes. right. Wow. They told us afterwards, they went in, they saw immediately that they were in the That it was endometriosis. Yes. Yeah. If, they, if they knew a little bit better, they probably would have known it was endometriosis to begin with. But, you know, that's a typical thing, you know. Yes. I mean, I know the intention was good, but this is another example of you know, maybe with a little bit more expertise in knowing what it was, you know, yeah. obviously and maybe it could have been pretty clear that it was endometriosis. And for our side, in that moment, we go in panic because Jesse, after go out the clinic, they told her you might have cancer. So when she came right. home, she said, we have cancer. So we know was thinking about nothing in that moment. We right. was blind. And then because now a little bit, I regret like to have a second opinion or whatever. But in that moment, like of course. I said, cancer, we need to do Im immediately because if you're broken, whatever. Mm -hmm. So we did that week. It was pretty scary that week. So like, like say, no, the things so this, it is really important when we're talking about it, because when you have a lot of opinions about the doctors, if you, I don't know, you know, it's much better be careful because then you end up with a big surgery like Jesse had. Right. And I've, right. I've struggled to since then to feel a little bit frustrated in the fact that we did go into the, such an invasive surgery, but I've had to kind of learn, you know, we only had as much information as we had at the time mm -hmm. to make a decision. So after that, once we learned more about endometriosis, I've always been thinking like my goal is to share as much information as possible so other people have knowledge to, you know, find a better situation than yeah. maybe our first and, one was. And ultimately in life, you know, like I think sometimes people get so stuck you know, whenever they have an outcome, whatever, they get really stuck in things and they get angry and they, you know, and that anger just eats you from, I think it's better to move on. You know right. what I'm saying? And, and look at things positively. And one of the things I actually love about you guys, and you have such a positive energy about yourselves and, you know, you sort of like even challenges, you address them. Like you almost see always the positive aspects. I really like about, you know, you, I think it's really uh, very attractive about you as people, as human beings, this ability to have, to be so positive, right? You know, I am, and it's not a mask. I could see it. I'm talking <laughs> to you guys, right? Yeah. Thank you. I yeah. mean, we have to be. If we, right. if we go the opposite direction, it's it's not good. It's not so. good. No, but, but there's a difference, you know, like I think I see sometimes people, they get like they get buried under the negativity, you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's very important, I think, to be able to let go. Mm. Yeah. Uh, whenever it comes to health things, to be able to just say, all right, you know what? Let it go and let's move forward, you know, instead of like, you know, right. just, but you know, you had the surgery. 
Um, yes. You know, one of the things that I have to say whenever these big open, first of all, it's not easy surgery right? because two big cysts and like, you know, a mess in there. It, it, and they probably, it's good that they saved the ovaries, which is nice, right? It's a, yes. thank God, right? Yes. And, uh, but obviously there's always going to be disease left behind when you do an open operation. It's just like unavoidable because you can't see the details. You can't see much, you know, you right. take the cysts out and then you close and boom, the disease comes back. Which is usually what happens. And, it is. and that is what happens. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> so tell me what happened then. Let's hear the story. We were actually told after that surgery, you know, hey, with this situation, you guys should try and, and get pregnant as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Like that's what the mm -hmm. recommendation was after mm -hmm. the surgery. We were not ready to start mm -hmm. having children at that time. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, well, thank you, but we're going to just go mm -hmm. on this path. I wasn't having all that crazy pain anymore. The surgery definitely took away my symptoms. Probably it was a year and a half later that everything started to come back and show itself again. I started to have pain again with my cycle, random pain with ovulation. We kind of started to realize, hey, something's going on. We had actually started to try and conceive about a year after surgery and it wasn't successful. We ended up going to see a couple new gynecologists because I said, I know it's back. I know the endometriosis is back. I know this is causing problems. I need to find somebody who knows what they're talking about. And we actually went through three doctors before I found somebody that I felt like would mm -hmm. listen and actually had a an idea and a, a mentality about it that resonated with me because mm -hmm. there were some that said oh i'm sorry if it's back hysterectomy oh i'm sorry I could menopause go menopause right I'm they moved the ovary they told us to remove the ovary and go that, menopause right there was one that said we're gonna have to remove that ovary if it's causing can more. you imagine you and imagine? I just, I just kept saying we, to Alessio, no, this is not it. Because we did the first <laughs> mistake there is say, no, we want to, uh, we start studying by ourselves uh, a little bit what to do. And then when they told us, oh, you need to remove the ovary and go in menopause. And then when you're ready, we're going to remake you try to have the thing. We said, no. And so we keep looking. And then actually we was coming in the list where people know about endometriosis. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with Nancy's Nook. Facebook of course. Thing. Who doesn't okay. know Nancy's Nook? <laughs> yeah. Um, I found them and I found the list of names to reach out to mm -hmm. and research. And suddenly I felt like I was on a better path, which thank goodness we knew to do all this research because we ha we went through three different people that gave me answers that I did not like. And without knowledge, I probably would have taken their advice and gone yeah. this way or that way. And, and we should give a shout out to Nancy because, uh, you know, she has done such an amazing job. And uh, um, you may not know this, but, you know, I run this organization with Dr. Sally Sorrell, the two of us, right? called the Endometriosis Summit, which yes. is a conference. And uh, she, Sally, um, you know, Nancy's coming this year to, you know, she's come before. So she's like a beacon of light in this world. And because it's tough to negotiate. If you've been to these groups, they can get pretty, you know, intense, right? They are. Yeah. They are. It's hard to moderate there, you know? Yes. It's hard to moderate it. You know, it's like one of those things that, but, you know, and people, doctors look down on social media, you know, like sometimes like, oh, you look on Google, you know, they always give you a hard time, right? Yes. You know, whenever you say something, you know, they, they get they get defensive if you go like uh, say, but somebody said that, right? But I don't believe in that. I believe in the value of the opinion of people. So yeah. you ended up with a second surgery, right? What happened there? I did. So we ended up, um, well, actually, we ended up finding out through MRI that I had more endometriomas back mm -hmm. on the ovaries and actually had... Um, like a lesion retrorectally, mm -hmm. which I had started to have a lot of pressure and like pain towards my tailbone. So they mm -hmm. saw this on the MRI. They said, we're pretty confident that this is endometriosis as well. Mm -hmm. We need to schedule a surgery. So we scheduled mm -hmm. a surgery. And then what happened? I got pregnant. <laughs> and yeah. we said, wow, okay, let's postpone the surgery. Mm -hmm. Let's see how this goes. Um, unfortunately, it ended up 
in a miscarriage. And then we took a little bit of time about a few weeks to recover from that before scheduling the follow-up surgery. Do you feel comfortable talking about the miscarriage? I see that sure. you're getting a little emotional yes. about uh, it. I always get emotional talking about it, but I have no problem sharing it because I feel like it's something that people don't share because sometimes I feel like it's a taboo subject. So right. even though it'll always emotionally affect me, I'm happy to to talk about it. It's a type of situation, in my opinion, pregnancy loss, where, you know, uh, the doctors have a tendency, they see it every day and they say, oh, everybody has a miscarriage, no big deal. You know, these things happen. But I always think of it like, you know, what if you're like a doctor who, uh, you know, you're a brain surgeon, and you see people with brain tumors every day, you know what I'm saying? You know, another day at the office for you, seeing a person with a brain tumor is a, a life changing dramatic event for a person. Right. You know, like, you know, so you can't just be so dismissive of these very traumatic events. And I think doctors have a tendency to be, and, and I'm not here to trash doctors, but they tend to be very dismissive of pregnancy losses in my experience. They're like, ah, don't worry, it happens. You know, like they're not like, they're not even like, oh, I'm sorry about what happened. They're more like, yep, yeah, you know, like that, like that. Right. And it's just uh, definitely, uh, we did encounter a little bit of that going through the situation. Did you ever, did you see a heartbeat in the pregnancy at all or no? We did not. It ended up too early for that. Mm -hmm. We we ended up conceiving a year and a month after we started. Mm -hmm. And so we found out like as soon as I missed my my period Mm -hmm. and we kind of went a couple weeks and then I had a little bit of blood. And that's when Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be okay. It could not be okay. Mm -hmm. We went in. And they said, well, your levels are still good. Maybe it's just a little bit of bleeding. Mm -hmm. Let's just ride it out and see. Mm -hmm. Waited another week and a half. And then I ended up having a miscarriage. miscarriage. So, And we were never able to get a heartbeat on the ultrasound just because it was too early. And by the time that I ended up having the miscarriage, they seemed to think that the embryo had stopped developing about a week or so before that. So... And usually, I don't know if it's going to help you, but whenever you don't see a heartbeat, it's more likely that it's a genetic loss. Mm. So it's more probable that that's the case. Although we don't know because with the endometriosis that causes more miscarriages, also my pregnancy losses. But right. yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that because people don't yeah. recognize that it's a trauma. And, you know, because if, it's like these horrible ups and downs. First, you have the excitement. We're pregnant. Oh, so great. And then like, boom, you know, like, yes. and... Uh, and having never been through it, people don't even imagine that they could have a miscarriage. You know, they're shocked. When we were in that whole year of trying to conceive where it kind of takes over your daily life, mm. like always tracking things, mm. always, you know, seeing if you're positive that month, though it's not, okay, go through the right. same thing again and again. After going a whole year. It's like, of, Alessio, I'm ovulating. Right. <laughs> yeah. Stop work. everything. It's now Exactly. <laughs> And after doing all of that, where every day of our life was consumed by this, when we got the positive pregnancy test, we were over the moon. We thought, oh my gosh, finally, it's our time. It didn't even cross my mind that it could miscarry, miscarry because I just felt like, finally, okay, we, we did our time, we did our waiting, here we go. We had immediately already envisioned the future of what it would be. And then as soon as we did that, it was just whoop, gone, just taken right away. So mm-hmm. it was, like you said, just a, a total up and down roller coaster. Roller coaster. Yeah, it was down. Yeah. yeah, it was really rough. And um, and then to know that I had to basically turn around and go right into another surgery was <laughs> equally as draining. So we take it, we go home, sad. We were really, really sad. It was big. And, and scared, and, and scared too, right? Because it's yeah. like, what's going to happen now? What, what's and then, next? And then we always, you know, when you're there, you start asking you a lot of questions. Why happen? It is because we take a walk, you know. Yeah, right. It is yeah. because we eat something wrong. So because uh, you ate the wrong pesto, I think that's what happened. <laughs> yes. It was not. It was not the best pesto. You you didn't know yet. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. That's what happened. Yeah. 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 Jokes apart, yeah, it, it's it, you know we're joking, but obviously the the 
the reality of, you know, sort of like self-doubt, self-blaming, which happens in these situations. And uh, I always personally try to make an effort whenever in these situations, you know, my staff knows because we deal with this type of stuff every day, you know what I'm saying? So we always try to, you know, understand what people, try to be compassionate. Compassionate, what does it mean ultimately? It means that think about the other people, what they're going through and uh, try to understand and be respectful of their feelings. There's not a whole lot of that, you know, in medicine, unfortunately. Right. No, there is also some, but not a lot, I feel. And when you do get it, when you do get that compassion from a medical team, it makes a huge, huge difference. difference. It's, yeah. It just means the world. You were telling me that you went on and had, after the loss, unfortunately, you, you went on and had a, another surgery. T- tell me about the surgery, what happened. Yes. So that was a laparoscopy. I had a lot of adhesions, inflammation, mm-hmm. um, endometriomas on, I believe, mostly on the right ovary and maybe one mm-hmm. smaller one on the left. And then they kind of cleaned up what they were able to see in the peritoneum. I think I had even a little bit on my diaphragm that they removed. And then they did the big one, which was the retrorectal Mm -hmm. thing, which still to this day, I have a hard time even understanding what Mm -hmm. all that was. I actually had two. Was it, was it, was a colorectal surgeon involved in the procedure? Yeah. yeah. So my um, endometriosis surgeon has a colorectal guy that Mm -hmm. she tag teams with on these Mm -hmm. surgeries. Everything was cleaned out. They said we got everything that we could find. Did they have to take a piece of your bowel or they were able to take it out without taking a piece? They did not take a piece, which I was mentally prepared for if they were going to have to do that obviously I was hoping that it wasn't because it's such a huge recovery process Um, but they were able to remove it without but they said that they were trying to err to be more conservative given the fact that they wanted to preserve my fertility as much as possible they knew that we were trying presently Mm -hmm. and that we were going to jump back in to trying to conceive as soon as I healed up so they were able to from what they said remove that without resecting anything mm-hmm. good um, good so how I've many been... hours how many hours was the surgery what was it do we want to say like two hours and 45 minutes right yeah. one, it was under three hours but mm-hmm. more than two and i can't mm-hmm. remember exactly how much but i want to say it was two hours and 45 minutes long um, Did you go home the same day or you stayed in the hospital that night? No, I was in the hospital. I ended up staying a few nights, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was anticipating to go home the next day, but I I was having some weird kind of thing where my blood pressure, they could, I kept trying to get up and walk after surgery. And then Alessio would have to catch me because I was just like, got up and boom, got up and boom. So they wanted me to stay and monitor me to make sure they could get me regulated. I had all the joys of the laparoscopic shoulder Gas pain. pain. Oh, <laughs> that is bad. It is really bad. Right. Um, but right. yeah, I I felt pretty good considering. I was just yeah. happy to get it all out again because I had mm-hmm. had, I started to have all that pain again, just felt like I couldn't get relief. So I was ready to get it out. So we did that second surgery. And, and when was when was that? That was two, almost exactly two years from my first surgery. So that was October 2020. So they told us to wait a couple of months to mm-hmm. get my cycle back. And then we could start trying to conceive again. Second cycle after surgery, I started to have a lot of abnormal bleeding. Mm. And they sent me in for, um, the word is escaping me right now, where they check to see- if Sonohysterography, hysterosopingogram. Yes, yes yeah. thank you. At HSG, that's what it was. Mm-hmm. So I had one of those to see if my tubes were blocked. And mm-hmm. at that time, they were open. open. Mm-hmm. The right side was a little bit- Slow. And a little bit mm-hmm. slow to to go through. We ended up figuring out a few months later that my tubes were blocked. And, and then it just kind of, I was just, I kind of spiraled at that. I'm sorry, the IVF thing. I was, well, did I ever check your ovarian reserve and see what your uh, 
AMH floor, FSH? Did you did they check that? They, what was that? I believe it was two point eight. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. value. Yeah. yeah. So they were all really happy considering that I had two huge cysts at the beginning and mm -hmm. then another surgery. Okay. So no, it was a happy. very good value. It's a very good value for somebody who had two surgeries, actually. Yeah. And so they ended up doing that. We at that point, we were we were feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I felt like I had gone through a lot of procedures. I was hesitant to go through more procedures at that time. So mm -hmm. at that point, we actually decided, let's take a little break just to mentally heal, like we're trying to physically heal. Was it, was, uh, so was there a, re a second repeat AMH at all for this or no? Just that one? Or is it, has there oh, been another AMH? So we did do AMH once we, um, mm. so what, when was this? Last fall, right? Last fall. Mm. Last fall, when we decided to jump in and start our IVF process, we repeated my AMH and it actually went up. It was 3.0. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's really good. I know. I was the so doctors excited. did a good job. I have to congratulate the doctors. They did an excellent job, you know? Yes. So that's really positive. I it love was it. Very good I news. love it. Yeah, that's really good news. Damage the ovary. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> you know? That's really nice. Yeah, that's really, really good. You're bringing up, I think, two important team, themes, I think. One is the fact that... Uh, the fertility theme, which maybe we'll do another chat about, and which is basically sometimes endometriosis issues then morph into something different, right? right. You know, that's one one theme I think that's important. And the second one is the one of mental health. Yes. Because obviously, how much stress can a person take? You know what I'm saying? One surgery, they tell you you have cancer. Oh, I have cancer. I'm going to die. Oh, no, no, you're not going to die. Okay, but open surgery. It's like... Then you're pregnant. Oh, I'm pregnant. No, you're not pregnant. Uh, you know, a miscarriage. You know. And then one more surgery. It's this type of like experiences take an enormous toll on the mind, on the spirit, on everything. It's very hard to endure. There can be problems also in the couple. Do you feel like this thing affected you guys a little bit? Zero. Honestly, I feel extremely lucky to have Alessio because he, from the beginning was one that would go and research, try to understand, try to find solutions, always listen to me when I said, I know I don't look like I'm in pain and I'm having these problems, but just trust me when I say I feel horrible. And he always just took it for what I would say. And and I just feel very lucky for yeah. you because I, I realize that that's a huge blessing. And that is something to be extremely grateful for because like you said, all of this up, down, up, down, up, down is just so taxing on individuals. When you're trying to work together as a couple, it can really, it can fracture a lot of relationships. 100% because first of all, sometimes people are not in line. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, one person can be sad and the other one's like, oh, let's go to the movies. And like, I don't want to go to the movies. And like, right. you know, but it's like, you know, let's go to the, I don't want to go to, you know, you, you start creating these like sort of like cracks in the relationship because people, it's hard, you know what I'm saying? To communicate properly, I think, you know, I think that's really like a big one to be able to communicate. And it's important to understand that everybody has feelings, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes uh, one part of the couple can be more like sort of like, oh, don't, don't worry about it. One, sometimes one part of the couple says, oh, there's a problem, then we won't do it. You know what I'm saying? You mm -hmm. know, that's another type of reaction that somebody says, you know what, we're having a challenge, then I give up. Yeah. You know Cut what it I'm off saying? Completely. Yeah. And uh, the other person like, wait a second, give up, let's wait. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's really one of those things that are, that you guys, you know, are doing pretty well, it seems to me. And I was, I was watching you guys, uh, sometimes talking about these things and I could see like very positive energy. And that's why I think you're going to be successful Thank in you. your, Thank in you. your everything. I know there were a bunch of questions. Shall we tackle a few? We don't have a lot of time, but maybe there sure. are some that are good ones. Let's see. Let's go ahead. So we talked a little bit about what endometriosis is, but I know a lot of people were wondering what causes it? Where does it come from? What's, what's going on with this? The answer is that, um, we don't really know exactly 
the mechanism. We do know that these cells are very similar to the endometrium. And, uh, you know, one of the most uh, established theories is that they are pre-existing, you know, from, from childbirth, basically. But there are certain conditions in the body that allow for the formation of these cysts. And because everybody behaves differently, in some people you have this ramp up and they grow very quickly. Sometimes people don't even have cysts. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it, you know, like every complex condition is the result of multiple, is multifactorial and it's a, and the way it behaves, it depends on how the body reacts to the problem. For example, in certain people, they make a lot of fibrosis. So they end up having those big invasive masses. In some people, it's superficial and they have that superficial disease that you can't even see, but they have a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Some people make cysts. We don't really know exactly how to control all these different elements, but we do know that the result is that of an inflammatory condition. So ultimately, if somebody asks me, what is endometriosis? I always say, which is what Alessio said earlier, it's an inflammatory condition. And that's really what it is. It's inflammation that keeps on recurring over and over and over, and it creates problems in the body, systemic problems and local problems. And that's really what, what it really is. I always find it fascinating when I see your videos where you highlight the actual inflammation in between mm -hmm. the organs. It is mind-blowing to me. So if people are, are curious to actually see with their eyes what it really looks like, they yeah. have to go check do you, out. The video. Do you have any pictures of your surgery that you want to show us? I do have pictures of my surgery. I have my, the, my most recent one. Let's see here. Shall we? Shall we take a look at them? Yes. So my, I don't know if I touched on my most recent surgery in the fact that I did end up having a fallopian tube removed. I think that's your liver and the diaphragm. Um, maybe something small on the diaphragm, nothing really major, nothing really major. The doctor did a very good job at taking good pictures, which is great. Let's go up on the images. Up, up, raise it. Okay. The important picture is the one here, okay, where we see the uterus um, uh, and uh, on the left side, you know, on the, you know, Which yeah, one? The, 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 yeah, that one there. You can see, we can see the ovary that looks okay. You know, I don't even see the right ovary in this picture because I feel that it's buried under adhesions there and stuck on top of the bowel. Mm. And I can see that the uterus was flexed. And all yeah. stuck together, all stuck together. Okay, so we could see that the left tube was a little swollen even at the time. You know what I'm saying of the surgery? Yes. yes. So, you know, maybe in hindsight, I would have taken that tube too, you know, at the same time, you know, because that's still a little swollen already there. But it makes sense that the doctor wanted to leave the tube to give you a chance to get pregnant on your own, you know, but it does look a little... Yes, a she little. mentioned that it was dilated. Um, they chose to leave it because the is it the fimbrillated? The thing? fimbria still were. I could see the fimbria, and I can understand why they left it. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, it wasn't a very big septum. You know, the the data on septums is, uh, you know, I think they did. I agree with removing that septum because it's not that small, and it can mm -hmm. be associated with miscarriages. So that people know it's that red line that you see in between. Oh. That's the septum, basically, right? Yes. You know, like, you know, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's that red line. You know, it's, it's like a thickening. It's like, it means like a heart-shaped uterus. And it's good that they did that. Very, very nicely done, Jesse. Very nicely done. The big, the big dilemma there that you have now is that fallopian tube, right? Mm -hmm. Because the fertility doctor is going to tell you, oh, you have a hydro... In, in Italy, the fertility doctor is going to tell you, Hey, you have a uh, this swollen <laughs> too, but what are we gonna do about that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And they're gonna they're gonna tell you you need another surgery to take that tube out, you know, or clip it or something. Right. Know? It's a tough question that we can address another time. But yeah, we, we could talk about we, that in the fertility. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Was there another another question there? Yeah. So we have some more. Um, how can we get diagnosed? How can we get doctors to take our symptoms seriously and not just brush? us off when we're describing our symptoms and what we're experiencing? Look, ultimately comes down to um, if, 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 you, if you feel that you're not being listened to, just walk away. I mean, I, I just don't feel that if I go to a doctor and the doctor's blowing me off, why do I have to convince that doctor? It's not my job. You know what I'm saying? You know, to convince. And even, even if I did, 
what am I gaining? Maybe the doctor reluctantly will do something just to make me happy. I mean, like, right. I, I don't need to be appeased. You know what I'm saying? I just need to be listened to. And, and that's really, you know, this sort of paternalistic attitude, which we have a lot in Italy, we have maybe a little bit more of that, you know, yeah. but, mm-hmm. uh, but it has to go, you know, if, uh, in my opinion, it's just, you know, talk with your feet. If the doctor doesn't listen, go find yeah, another one, you know, right. and you don't have to fight a battle. You can just say, look, okay, goodbye. You know, ciao. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just really? Say, well, that's what just I think. Say ciao. Our job as patients, because I, I, I'm a patient too sometimes, uh, you know, is to find the people that are willing to listen, you know, and, and if they aren't, you know, I, I'm not going to go there and educate. It's not my job to educate you. You're the expert. What am I doing? You know? Right. Yeah. Right. And I think too, like a lot of times, let's say your primary care physician heard the symptoms and is recommending you to go to a specific person. Sometimes mm-hmm. I think people forget you don't have to stay with that person. If you don't like right. that person, do some research, find a person. If you have to get a referral, go back to your primary right. care physician and say, I want to see this person make it happen. Right. I can understand if you live in a small place and, and uh, you know, um, I wouldn't really worry too much about the doctor's feelings, really. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? If there's no, if you, if you, you just move on, you know, like don't, don't even fight a battle. What's the point? Everyone wants to know diet, food, supplements. Can it help? Does it affect anything? For example, la pasta. <laughs> la pasta. Fa male all the The most kills you. It's deadly. The, no, you, the, know. you know, a lot of people thinking that the the actually the pasta because the pasta I have the how you call it gluten. the gluten the gluten make more inflammation, right? So if we need to fight the inflammation, we should uh, remove some food, or it is just endometriosis working by herself. Doesn't matter what we're doing. Well, the truth is, you know, in the middle, right? Somewhere, right? Because the reality is that. There are some, uh, you know, diets that are more inflammatory than others, right? You know, and obviously uh, people know that, uh, you know, if you follow like a healthier diet, it's better. Um, And you see people going to these extreme, uh, you know, diet of elimination, eliminate this, eliminate that, eliminate this, eliminate that. I mean, I personally think that Maybe for a short time, you could do an elimination diet, but it, it cannot be a long-term solution. Right. I mean, you know, to do a full elimination diet where you're only eating, you know, broccoli, how, how is that going to, you know, how are you going to be for your whole life do like this? You know what I'm saying? I think that, yes, obviously one should, you know, it's better to be lower on carbs, I think, in general, in life. And it's, uh, you know, I know, I know Alessio is a very big fan of that very glutinous, high quality pasta. <laughs> and my wife now, like, you know, you ruin my life because my wife wants to say, get only the good pasta now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, every time we walk in the alley, we see like those, I'm not going to name any brands, but some of those American style pasta, which are, you know, not particularly not the best. good. I always, we always have a good laugh. Uh, but, uh, you know, the thing is that very glutinous pasta i i feel the different the difference actually mm-hmm. worse it's worse i feel i feel that i feel you know because i don't need a lot of carbs when i eat like a very glutinous you know if i go to like a restaurant they tell me oh this pasta is like the best blah blah blah, blah. and then i feel very sleepy for some reason because mm-hmm. i have that whole glutinous very glutinous pasta so Blowing i feel gluten down. that crazy glutinous thing is probably ever but you know to go completely completely off you could do it for a month before your embryo transfer. You know what I'm saying? But right. to do it for your whole life, what the heck? It just seems too much to me. You know, what are you going to do? I mean, some of the patients who have like big endo belly, which you describe the endo belly, you remember that? They do feel better when they eliminate gluten and they eliminate dairy. It's a fact. But it's because there's endometriosis there, you know, like, in a, so it's not a cure. It's just you're... You're li- you're restricting your you're making your food world smaller and smaller and smaller so you could just live, but what kind of life is it? You know that's really the question. Speaking of inflammation, though, there were a lot of questions about the relationship between endometriosis and other conditions like 
I think Ellers Dollar, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, yeah, Ellers Dollars, yeah. Um, celiacs, IBS, thyroid, all these other conditions. It's a, it's a fact, you know, because endometriosis is associated with other conditions, that most of which are autoimmune. And more typically, uh, you have a lot of bowel conditions because it's proven that people who have endometriosis is a two and a half chance greater of having ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease later in life. That's proven. Wow. Also other autoimmune conditions like Sjogren syndrome and lupus. It's proven that there's an association. And it could be because it's an inflammatory condition and you have all this inflammation and that triggers that. One other possible reason is a lot of people with endometriosis have to take birth control pills for a very long time. And that's associated later in life with ulcerative colitis. So that's another reason. Um, when it comes to um, other autoimmune conditions, is I still think it's related to this whole inflammatory process. You know, like you know, so everything is interconnected. When it comes to Ellen's downloads, which is a connective tissue disorder, where people are hyperflexible. They flex their, you know, it's like a, it's a defect in the, in the, in the connective tissue of the joints where people are very flexible. There has been association with that. Although we don't know that if people who have illness dialogues, because they have a lot of pain, they're looked into more deeper. And so they're more likely to have find the endometriosis there. We don't really know, but I see a lot of patients with that. In fact, I'm doing surgery on somebody, I want to say tomorrow or the next week that has that. So it's very common actually. Extremely common. To me that you, you're you able to just balance normal life and surgery and just like, just the fact that you said, oh, I love it. <laughs> I love doing surgery. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, because, you know, when you do surgery, you work with your hands. It's like you're making a chair or you're making pasta or you're making pizza. You know, you're, whenever you work with your hands, you're always happy. So big question that we got asked a ton of times is menopause, hysterectomy, pregnancy, do any of those things cure endometriosis? The short answer is no. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these are all triggers, right? The reason why people ask, folk ask this question is because it's a big trigger. Because, you know, the typical thing is that, oh, you have endometriosis, get pregnant. Oh, you have endometriosis, let's take your ovaries out. Oh, you have endometriosis, take your uterus out. These are all the false profits of endometriosis telling people to do stuff that is basically doesn't help mm -hmm. doesn't help them and why is this a problem it's a problem because all these approaches that we just mentioned although they may bring like a temporary solution sometimes they can make things worse hysterectomy can help obviously people have heavy bleeding and pain obviously that can help but Sometimes people do the hysterectomy and leave the endometriosis behind. That's a problem. Second problem, uh, artificial menopause. You, you're, you're, you're trading one problem for another set of problems and the pain may persist. Why make a, a young person menopause? That's crazy. And the third thing, obviously, pregnancy. Pregnancy can ameliorate temporarily the symptoms. But after that, the symptoms go back. It, the endometriosis comes back. So none of these are a cure. And it's the one thing that really, I'm glad you asked this because it's the one thing that really irates people with endometriosis whenever they hear this. Thank you for asking. Yes, when yes. You are at home, ask the question. That was a great question. <laughs> I know I've personally been presented all three of those things yes. as a, a uh, fix for my yeah, exactly. fix. Transitioning from you talking about all the symptoms and the pain and everything, mm -hmm. other than surgery, what can people do to just resist and manage day by day because obviously surgery is the goal to excise right. it all out but not everyone can just run in immediately and get surgery there is value to medical treatment obviously right you know and we can't just knock medical treatment despite the fact that there are problems with medical treatment any medicine involves side effects any medicine can involve uh uh, unpleasantness and sometimes unfortunately this a, a temporary solution to a problem involves a compromise and mm -hmm. that's really what it is and uh, in the case of endometriosis uh, hormonal management has to play a role in endometriosis to some degree 
you know, like obviously surgery, like we said, is the mainstay of it, but you know, um, it, it, hormones unfortunately have to play a role and birth control plays birth control play a role. Why? Because they control the symptoms pretty well in some people. Mm-hmm. And for the people in, in, in which the, the symptoms are well controlled, it's definitely worth trying. And uh, um, for some, some people cannot take birth control pills because they have medical problems. Some people have mental health problems when they take birth control pills. They get depressed. Some people get even suicidal, weight gain. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But in reality, uh, I would not completely, absolutely exclude medical approaches to endometriosis because you, you sort of like automatically uh, given up a, something that could potentially help you, you know, even transitionally. So I think it's definitely, I, I know that it's another trigger for people because they've been to so many doctors and so many doctors have told them, here's a pill pack, take this. But, but obviously the doctor may not know your whole story, your whole history. And so maybe they say, did you try birth control pills? And you go, ah, no, birth control, they told me already. But you know, the reality is that one has to try it. And then if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it's certainly something to consider some level of hormonal management. Right. Physical therapy. Physical therapy really works. And I and love we don't... therapy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Pelvic physical therapy is amazing. And uh, it has a major role. And I think it's not taken seriously enough. There's not enough physical therapists, which is one of the reasons why pelvic, you know, there's, especially depending where you live, you may have less options. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, and, and uh, or maybe they're just one or two options. But the reality is that pelvic physical therapy is very, very important. Uh, physiatry, you know, like, you know, pain management, you know, you need pain management. And unfortunately, you need to go to experts in pain management. You can't just rely in somebody, just some doctor giving you 10 Percocets every once in a while. You need somebody who actually knows what they're doing and help you managing this thing. So the reality is one needs to have a team, but as usual, the big problem in the world is that if you don't have money, if you don't have good health insurance, you can't get it, right? Yeah. Alessio, that's the deal, right? (laughs) That's the deal. If you don't have money, you can't really do a lot of this stuff because a lot of this is, uh, yeah, you know, you got to pay for it, pay for play, right? That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, it's sad because yeah. when you're in the throes of all that pain yeah. and it's just like beating you down. Right, right, exactly. All you want and is something really... to take it away. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like I said, like, you know, I, I think that you, you need to reach out to those physical therapists, those uh, um, physiatrists and the pain pain management. It, it's a reality. You know, you can't just expect your gynecologist to give you a prescription every once in a while. Right. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's sad, but it doesn't work. And, and in other parts of the world, they have it even worse because they don't even want to give you anything. Hmm. You know, it's just really bad, pretty bad. It's, it comes down to the fact that it's a multi-specialty, multidisciplinary type of thing, which very few places have, you know, and that's really what it is. I'm actually doing physical therapy post-surgery, mm-hmm. kind of getting mm-hmm. in between surgery and our embryo transfer, mm-hmm. trying to get my pelvic floor back mm-hmm. in working order. Because I think with all the things going on, it's yeah. just, it's not happy yeah. right now. <laughs> and, and and Dr. Sally Sorrell, who is my partner in the Endometriosis Summit, uh, is a physical therapist and pelvic physical therapist. So um, and just I want to tell you a little bit about our organization, the Endometriosis Summit, which Thanks is a patient-focused organization that Dr. Sorrell and I founded. And it's an amazing organization. And we have these meetings and we do advocacy. And the physical therapy is a big part of what we do. You know, because we think about that. We think about mental health. Uh, mental health, very important. Um, of course, you know, there's also the medical surgical aspect of it. But, you know, really... We look at everything because if you don't look at everything, you can't just, including alternative medicine, including diet, including supplement, everything is important, really. It's, you got to chip away at it in pieces. There isn't like one magic bullet. The same thing is for fertility a little bit, you know, it's like, you have to work at it with a chisel. It's not like a bomb thing. You know, that's really what it is. You know, you're not going to do it with a hammer. You have to do it with a chisel and it's hard. It's very hard. Is there ever a point when you feel that having a surgery would be more damaging than just leaving what endometriosis is there? For sure. 
for sure. Um, and this is especially true in the context of fertility, right? You know, because, uh, you know, the decision of surgery has to be made in the context of the situation of the patient. It's not like just because it's there, you have to go after it. You have to ask the following questions. Is it symptomatic? Is fertility the only issue? How old is the patient? How many surgeries has the patient already had? Because each subsequent surgery can create more damage to the ovaries. So one has to look at all these elements and then make that decision. So it shouldn't be just a knee-jerk reaction. You have to take it out. Of course, if there's a 10-centimeter cyst, the cat's out of the bag. But you, right. you one should, you know, of course, you didn't know at the time. But one shouldn't really get to that point, you know. But so if there's something that's six and then you do another ultrasound and it's seven and, you know, at that point, you got to go for it. You can't just let it grow. But for the ordinary person that has a small cyst and maybe, you know, maybe it's worth waiting. Maybe it's worth going for the IVF first mm -hmm. and see what happens there. Maybe it's worth banking the eggs and the, as hard as IVF is. So it has to be tailored to the individual. You can't just say surgery, 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 surgery. It's amazing that you guys, you know, went out there and shared everything, you know, including the pictures uh, about your story and, uh, and uh, in, in such a candid way. And I really would like to thank you for really doing this. And, you know, I think people will really appreciate what you did, you know, today. Um, I, I know I do. And, uh, and obviously with your very positive energy, you're going to get people, you're going to inspire people. You're going to be an inspiration for people. Thank you. Thank for you guys. I love meeting you yeah. guys. It was fantastic. We, 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 it was very long, but I think it was worth it. Amazing. I think so. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.